The Liberating Arts seeks to articulate the enduring relevance of a liberal arts education during a time of pandemic and protest. Through our online platform, we will host a series of conversations with writers, academics, institutional leaders, and public intellectuals about the nature of the liberal arts, their formational purpose, and their moral significance in a time of great cultural disruption. We hope to inspire viewers and listeners to learn more about the liberating effects of these arts on their own lives. To find out more, please visit www.theliberatingarts.org or find us on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, or YouTube. Well, welcome all who have joined us. Um, thank you. Um, our, our discussion tonight is titled Beyond the Classroom, uh, what is the role of print journals in cultivating wisdom? And I think as we were just discussing, uh, wisdom can seem like a scarce resource these days. So um, maybe our, our discussion tonight can at least shed a bit of light on uh, a longer perspective than the events of uh, the moment. And I'm, I'm delighted to be joined by three really gifted editors from fine uh, magazines and who, who write um, not only for their own publications, but elsewhere. So I'm sure you've read their work from, in various places. Um, so I'll be asking these three panels, I'm gonna introduce them in a moment, and then I'll be asking them a, a sort of series of questions and hoping that we can have a somewhat free ranging discussion. Uh, but please feel free to uh, raise your own questions or respond in the Q&A feature. I believe that's available to you all. And we will be sure to leave some time near the end to at least uh, respond to some of those questions once we can get to. So please feel free to chime in so that it can be as much like a dialogue as Zoom permits. But I'll begin with a few introductions. Uh, with us tonight is Barbara McClay, who is a senior editor at the Hedgehog Review, but she's also written for many publications, uh, Commonweal, often The New Yorker, Baffler, Image, Outline, etc. Thank you for being here. Hello. Peter Momsen is the editor of Plow Quarterly uh, and author also of Homage to a Broken Man, The Life of J. Heinrich Arnold. Hope I said that correctly. That's he right, lives, Jeff. Okay. He lives with his wife, Wilma, and their three children in Fox Hill uh, in Walden, New York. So welcome, Peter. And then Ann Snyder is the editor-in-chief of Comment and the host of Breaking Ground, which is a collaboration also with Plow. Uh, and others created just this past year to, to try to inspire a dynamic cross-section of thinkers and practitioners to respond to the major crises of this year with wisdom, hope, and courage. Uh, and she's also a 2020 Emerson Collective Fellow and the author, relatively recently, of The Fabric of Character, A Wise Giver's Guide to Renewing Our Social and Moral Landscape. So welcome as well, Anne. Uh, so I wanted to sort of begin with, I guess I should also say that, that this is hosted by two organizations, Valpo, Valparaiso University's Institute for Leadership and Service, uh, led by Davy Hendrickson, and, and the Liberating Arts, which is also a collaborative project that hosts conversation about the enduring value of the liberal arts for the particular challenges of our time. Um, and it might seem a bit odd to link liberal arts education with the work of print journals. Uh, but I think magazines have a remarkable ability, as we'll talk about tonight, to convene a conversation and to invite readers into the ongoing work of learning. So they're, they're educational. Uh, our public discourse <laughs> is so fractured right now in many ways. Uh, and as readers, our attention can be drawn in many different directions at once. And it's hard to, uh, to think through problems in a systemic fashion. So a magazine kind of offers a, a set syllabus. Read these essays, these poems, these stories, think about these topics. Uh, and in particular, all three of the, the magazines represented here publish themed issues, right? So that they can kind of contribute to uh, the sense of a focused and yet still wide ranging uh, conversation, a conversation that ranges across disciplines and also across time. So I hope that's enough of a, uh, a pitch to make the connection between education, the liberal arts, uh, and the work of curating or editing a, a print periodical. But the first question, the kind of opening question I wanted to, to ask tonight uh, aims to bridge this gap between the university and um, the world of, of journalism. So I, I guess I would just open it up to you to, to 
articulate how you might understand the relationship between your particular publication and higher education. For instance, uh, I imagine many of your readers have college degrees, uh, probably most of your authors as well. So what do you see, uh, in what ways, I guess, do you see your magazines depending on healthy institutions of higher ed and how might some of the pressures that colleges and universities face be similar to those that small uh, publications face? Uh, it's a great question. I can take a first step at it. Um, thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's an honor to be with these two, by the way, who I really look up to, these two editors in chief. So thanks for inviting me in. Um, uh, so a couple things. One, um, in Comment's case, um, yes, a fair number of our authors are actually faculty or sometimes think tank scholars, um, more often faculty, colleges, universities. Um, since Although since I came on board about a year ago, I made a fairly explicit effort to sort of leaven that quite intentionally with not necessarily 50-50, but a real mix of do what I call just sort of doers, practitioners, community shepherds, organizational leaders, um, sort of people of praxis who are embodying some of some ideas a lot of the time or sort of facing the consequences of the rubber meeting the road of certain ideas to sort of pair their reflection and narratives about their lives, the crevices of a lot of our cultural fault lines with scholars. So we try to like bridge the thinking, often very verbally fluent person with the doer who sometimes feels less confident in their verbal abilities. But so anyway, so yes, but but still it does, I would say like our magazine, I was sort of thinking about this, um, our magazine at its best, like really depends on people working in places where they're not afraid to express an original thought. Um, you know, I think there's like an old um, psychological uh, adage about children that, you know, they take the best and boldest and most generative adventures from a secure base, um, secure and loving base. And I think that's actually, you know, no different for any of us in our vocational adult lives, um, in our flourishing vocationally. And just quite frankly, as an editor, I can often sort of perceive those scholars that feel like they're walking on eggshells with everything they say, or those that are kind of just so cautious within their disciplinary bounds that they, um, they just feel like they can't strain towards the large humanistic vision that we sort of missionally strive to elucidate for our readers. Um, and, you know, as editors who are often feel like in the winds of public win, you know, public winds and, and, and public consequences, particularly in a fairly like culture war era, um, I often just like lament how a certain academic sense of, and this is not to criticize academics, but more the environment I think that is hap what's happened in higher ed. I just feel like the supply of content and voices that we would otherwise be interested in has shrunk a little bit. Um, so in some ways, and this is a little tricky to say, especially in the current moment, uh, given what happened yesterday in DC, but I do feel like the, um, the free, sort of freedom and diversity of thought that has been a hallmark of certainly the liberal arts education that has actually shifted or migrated to the world of magazines, um, not only to magazines, but I often find um, certain certain t faculty members who feel like they wouldn't be say they work at a uh, you know a certain kind of small Christian college who would no longer be welcome to give a lecture at Yale or whatever that you know that's kind of like a loss but they feel like they can still publish in Harper's or or whatever um, so that's just sort of interesting to me and then the final thing I'll say as a magazine that like while we really value the world of ideas, we also ultimately value something we call like faithful presence in the world. And we're coming from a certain like theological tradition. Um, you can usually tell those when we do attract kind of um, uh, writers who work in universities and colleges, you can usually tell those scholars that are reaching beyond the bounds of their own discipline and sort of thinking horizontally across disciplinary, which we really value and love um, in sort of trying to approach some deeper cultural questions. 
and also those who believe in sort of the, the formative role they have often in the lives of young people um, and sort of the formative task of education that they're not only interested in lengthening the resume of their published work. So, you know, my view in general is that healthy institutions forge and nourish people with a very holistic sense of vocation who have a fluency with pre-political goods um, like human dignity and honest and real relationships flowering in a place and, you know, our need for grace as sort of limited yet always growing human beings, et cetera. Um, and there's something about, I think, healthy institutions of higher ed that are cultivating a strong sense of community for their faculty in particular, and the sort of layers of mentoring and being mentored. You actually set, I actually sense that in the copy that we're trying to attract because we ourselves are trying to produce content that is a little bit formative in our readers' lives. So. Yeah, I could just uh, add in to what Anne was saying. In many ways, Plow um, has a similar mix uh, as what you were saying. We we aim specifically to uh, have writers, so people who are literarily gifted, uh, who have typically visited institutions of higher education in some form, um, thinkers, and there you're really talking about people who are trained to come up with, um, you know, good ways of looking at the world and and doers. Um, who think and um, write, but are primarily known for um, get, kind of getting their hands dirty, putting those ideas into practice. And in all those ways, um, we absolutely uh, depend on higher education, specifically on the liberal arts, uh, specifically on there being uh, institutions in our society that ask the fundamental questions of how do we live well together? Uh, what gives life meaning and purpose? Um, what what is the good? What is the bad? Uh, is there guilt? Is there uh, forgiveness? Is there redemption? Uh, what should uh, discipline and punishment look like in our society? All those basic questions are un unanswerable from a technocratic point of view. And I believe those are things that depend on a, a healthy liberal arts humanistic um, set of institutions in our society so that people are able uh, to think about those things. And Traditionally, in our in this country, uh, for decades, centuries, that has been the university. Um, and of course, the background of your question, Jeff, I suppose, is this year uh, of the pandemic, which has accelerated in so many ways a crisis in the humanities. We've seen the numbers of uh, jobs that are disappearing in those areas. Um, those institutions that allowed that kind of humanistic in inquiry are under pressure, financial, um, cultural realities of where students are going in all kinds of ways. Um, so I, I think too, with and the relationship of small magazines to humanism in higher education is, is it kind of goes two ways. Our, our readership is largely educated, our writers, have benefited from these institutions. At the same time, um, I kind of feel like a, a small magazine like Plow or Hedgehog Review or, or Comment or others um, kind of is benefits in some ways um, from the humanists of today needing a refuge, needing institutions, needing places where they can talk to each other and explore ideas that don't make sense in a highly specialized uh, university environment. And um, I will just throw out there, uh, probably many in our audience will have seen um, a kind of provocative op-ed done by our colleagues um, from The Point magazine, John Baskin and uh, Anastasia Berg in The New York Times a few weeks ago on the reopening of the American mind where they make exactly this, this point that um, the liberal arts, the humanities, the humanistic project um, doesn't die if, even if it dies in higher education. and uh, but it does raise a challenge. What are those other institutions that can be built? And we would like to think, you know, magazines are one of those. Um, I don't know what Barbara uh, thought about that uh, suggestion from them. Well, I, uh, I want to backtrack a little bit because I think um, Hedgehog has an interesting, we materially rely on the existence, the continuing existence of UVA because we are attached UVA, you know, we're, we're under the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture, and then, uh, and in general, I think 
magazines like Hedgehog or Plow or Comment um, require the university because in a, in a healthier kind of environment, um, people aren't getting, so to speak, their main meal from writing for you. They have a job that pays them, but also appreciates their the kind of work that they're doing for you. Um, and so it doesn't matter that the math on like how much you can get for an essay, given how much work you put into it and so on, very rarely comes out in a sensible way because everyone's kind of being kept afloat by somebody else. Um, but I think, I mean, even in the world of academic publishing, it's, it's a problem because I guess two years ago, I went to MLA and uh, there was this panel about um, sort of general interest, but still academic publications uh, and how they were moving to attach themselves to university presses because that was an easier way to get funding but they themselves were increasingly no longer looked at as valuable, even though these places want their faculty to be publishing in journals like these. Um, but then like the next question is what happens to the press? What happened, you know? Um, so I, I agree with everything that um, Anne and Peter just said about, I think in particular the, the group of people who cannot find a professional life in academia, either because there simply are not enough jobs or for other reasons, um, they're a great boon, <laughs> as horrible as that is, uh, to, to a publication like the Hedgehog Review, because we get both the benefit of their, um, their expertise and their deep learning, and we get, uh, the, the fact that they aren't, they're not trying to get tenure, they're not trying to secure even a tenure track position so they don't need to be publishing in uh, professional journals. Um, but it also seems to me like all of these institutions uh, they all live in a kind of dependency on each other um, such that if if the Hedgehog Review could no longer draw from the university, I don't know that it could survive, not because there wouldn't be lots of great people to write for it, but because of the kind of material financial situation that would underlie that. Um, so I guess that is a slightly different approach. Uh, but, but yeah, I guess it, it seems like there's this financial entanglement that is necessary um yeah whether whether your publication is directly subsidized by by a university or as you were also saying whether your authors have the freedom to write for not very much money because their their main paycheck comes from a university and either right. that's a kind of indirect subsidy yeah you know. and they have access to university libraries you know, right. they're not buying their own research material. There, there's a lot of stuff that, um, like I used to have full run at the UVA library, but I, I moved. So now I only get online resources and I miss the UVA library every day. It was like having a superpower. <laughs> um, uh, but there's a lot structurally about how these things relate to each other. But I think the, the issue is if, if, the, if the biggest, structure no longer values humanistic study even in like the more specialized sense then it's certainly not going to value it in the more generalized sense and then how you continue to do the work that you're doing becomes a harder question i think right. maybe if i could pick up on what ann said a few minutes ago about the kind of narrowing of acceptable thought. And, and I think uh, of an essay you wrote, maybe in the last issue of Hedgehog, Barbara, uh, on cancel, cancel. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so clearly magazines aren't immune to these pressures, these sort of uh, partisan ideological lenses, I guess. 
but maybe they they have unique opportunities to to push against them in a way that uh, other institutions don't. I guess how have you found ways to navigate? the pressure, whether from readers or from funders or, or others who want you to toe a particular line um, and, and you want to be, uh, you know, I think oftentimes, Peter, it seems like your, your editorials, opening editorials will lay out, well, this is one narrative that one political party gives, chart a third course, um, you know, and kind of do something a little bit, find, find an imaginative, creative solution here that sees truth in both sides, but also limitations on both. Um, and how, how do you, I guess, yeah, how do you foster that? Do you get pushback from your readers or authors or others? Um, it, it seems like that kind of an approach perhaps is, is needed now more than, than ever. Well, I mean, just on that, to that point, absolutely. We get pushback from readers and, and we get, um, canceled subscriptions all the time, but that is why the readers we do have value. Um, I think magazines like you know, all the ones represented here, um, certainly Plow included, because it is so difficult um, to find places that aren't defined by this sort of bifurcated reality, you know, that we saw on display in the last 24 hours. Um, and there is, of course, economic reasons for that. Um, there's uh, magazines that because of their subscriber base um, or their donors, if they're nonprofit, um, can only sing a certain song and um, really don't have the freedom to go beyond that. Um, so, so I, I think one weakness of some of the cancel culture discourse um, is that it just ignores uh, underlying economic realities. And so one simple short answer, Jeff, is just financial independence of whatever form um, you can have. In the case of Plow, um, it's support by the Broodhoff community and by our subscribers and whoever donates to us. Um, but then on the other hand, I think it does get back to why we feel it's worthwhile doing these magazines in the first place. Um, that's really what kind of gets me out of, of bed every morning. I mean, actually my kids get me out of bed every morning, but um, after that, it gets me to work um, is the opportunity to, you know, uh, really do what, you know, humanism, humanism is originally all about and try to seek for the truth, um, try to see it in places where you wouldn't suspect it and where your readers wouldn't suspect it, um, try to bring people together who might find that they're actually seeking truth um, from different angles. And you're not, you're not looking, I don't think any of us are looking for a kind of fake common ground that doesn't really exist. But um, I, I take the example, for instance, of, of my old uh, professor Cornell West and his sort of uh, travels around with uh, Robert George from Princeton, uh, conservative and socialist. Um, it really is possible and we have to believe it's possible. I think more urgently than ever, it is possible for seeking truth together to mean something also in the real world. It's, n it's uh, not a an incredible luxury. It's not a, an extravagance um, or an irrelevance. It's really what uh, matters. And I think that's also what draws readers um, and makes them passionate. It excites writers to be part of projects like that and maybe interact um, with thinkers that they wouldn't in their normal uh, bubble. Yeah, at the, the Institute, there's a saying, it's like, write about the climate, not the weather. So it's like, uh, if you're interested in the kind of underlying why of why things happen, um, I think it's it's a delicate thing to walk because you don't want to pretend that there's fault on both sides of an issue if there is in fact not. Um, uh, I think, I mean, one example that was close to home was the, the Unite the Right stuff that happened in Charlottesville, you know, like, uh, uh, that, I think, um, anyway, I think so, you know, there, there's a kind of like fake charity that I think is useful to avoid. Um, but also often if you are, if you're interested in deeper questions, which a quarterly that comes out kind of has to be <laughs> by design, uh, I then 
you're not really going to be writing directly partisan things. You know, we come out three times a year, even if we tried to be super timely. By the time something goes to press in January and comes out in March, you know, what are you, you can't, you can't keep up that way. Um, so you have to adapt to it. I mean, I guess in terms of navigating backlash about pieces, um, I have a long held theory about, about people getting canceled, which is that it's not really about what, what a piece says. It's about people wanting to blow up your spot. <laughs> um, so as of yet, I mean, I guess the, the, the big advantage of being a little magazine is that no one really wants to, no one wants to unseat you because what can they unseat you from? Um, it's a kind of value of smallness and slowness. Um, that said, I do see like the point often gets pulled into stuff and, and so on. So, so the theory has some holes, but, um, but I always tell people like, like writers of mine who get really nervous about an argument and they're like, Oh, if I argue this thing, am I going to get canceled? Uh, and I always say no one gets mad at the hedgehog review. <laughs> It's never happened. Uh, and they find that very soothing. One day that won't be true. Perhaps even tomorrow. But for now, it works. Yeah, the virtues of, as you say, being small and slow. Uh, way, to, way to take the limitations and see them positively. Yeah. And do you want to add anything here? No, I think I would just say I'm, I'm always uh, I'm learning to get thicker skin when objections or canceled subscriptions come in. Um, I think at first, the first few, few first few months on the job, if that would happen, when that would happen, especially when you're, you know, people are trying to figure you out and are you bringing an agenda to this publication that we read and so on. Um, you know, I was often bending over backwards to write long epistles back to these offended readers. And, and I still believe in doing that, especially when I believe an argument is made in good faith. Um, and I actually need the clarity of mind to engage back and forth with the reader because um, we do write for them. Um, but, it's, you know, I think we probably all of us here, you can sense when a piece you've either commissioned or, or have received and you're about to publish is going to make waves and it's going to make some people really unhappy. But I, whenever I do that, it's not for the sake of, um, you know, controversy for controversy's sake or clickbait or, or whatever. Although, of course, a little extra fanfare or clicks, you know, that or your website breaking down because there's so much traffic or whatever. That's not like you don't complain when that happens. But, um, you know, I think you I think really seriously about, you know, this piece, we happened to have published a piece so recently that um, I knew was going to be a decently big deal. Um, and it was sort of taking down a book of um, uh, actually a friend of mine. And so but I believe the argument was well made. And I actually just wanted it to spark a longer term debate about sort of like breaking open some of in, in this case. I thought sort of some false, overly strong binaries between um, kind of like fear of quote unquote Christian decline in the West and persecution um, with some other um, um, other other goods uh, at stake. And I I I'm still very like happy to have published that essay, but there was definitely a sense of like, what I had to sort of interrogate myself. Why, why am I doing this? Cause I don't want to offend this person that I actually really esteem and have a section for who wrote the book that we're criticizing. And, um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, there's certain plumb lines. And I think, you know, I just, as I think about this question of offense and also how do you navigate just a very partisan era? Um, and when you're coming from a, the human, uh, humanistic tradition, and then in, at least Comet and Plow's case, both, you know, you add a bit of a, a sort of some faith um, to that. Um, I, I think, you know, it just, I find it helps, this is gonna be counterintuitive, but I try to, I, both just because I come from a journalistic background, it, it weirdly helps to be talking as best I can to lots of different kinds of people up and down the social strata demographically as much as I can ideologically, and to frankly get quite often confused and perplexed and overwhelmed by conflicting narratives felt passionately. And I don't enjoy that experience, but I think it's healthy to experience it as an editor, just so I have a sense to try to understand the emotive why, because so much of our intellectual life these days feels laden with emotion. Um, so trying to understand 
that that helps then when I'm deciding, look, I'm not doing this to hurt or I'm not doing this to create enemies. I'm trying to do this so that we can all perhaps engage in this very rare art form of debate and potential persuasion or softening hearts or conviction or whatever. Um, so it helps actually to seek confusion sometimes with these days are like very hugely, um, you know, vastly different realities that people are seeing and experience, you know, living as in terms of what, what the stakes are, what the nation is, what's their role in it, et cetera, what the good is. Um, and then I think, you know, it helps to have your, your plumb line. And I have one that or well, I have one that's really two, the fork that are always in tension with each other. Although I don't actually think they should be in tension, but they are in our current state. And that is, I care deeply about the health of institutions. And I really believe in sort of making sure those on the historic margins are um, not ignored. If anything, like the most honored. And I think those two things, and those are sort of personal values that I bring to this, but um, and I'm not saying the right values or anything, but they happen to kind of be criteria that help make those tough decisions when you know you're going to confuse, say, some of your conservative readers um, and or like totally cause a bunch of more progressive folks to just, you know, unsubscribe or whatever. Um, it just, like it helps, it just helps to kind of um, give you a sense of, I, I think there's something true here in what we're trying to do. And like, we're just trying to provoke people to think outside categories they're usually bombarded with a very reductionist set of categories on a daily basis every almost everywhere else jeff could i just jump in i mean i i very much agree with um what both ann and barbara have said and i think really um we all come from publications that have the privilege of being quarterly so here the medium really um is a big part of the answer actually in my day-to-day -day job um, if I were offer, offered the finances to become a weekly tomorrow, I don't think I would because I think it would change the whole nature of our project. I don't want to have to react um, to what's trending on Twitter, um, and we don't need to. Um, the other piece of it, as you mentioned, Jeff, all of us do themed issues. And what it seems to me a, a themed issue allows you to do is, um, and I actually run into problems with this with online-only articles, um, I think the issues allows a kind of good one-sidedness in a particular article. So for instance, um, in response to the Black Lives Matter protest, um, we could run um, something from a, a very angry, almost pro-violence perspective from um, a young writer in Detroit who was very involved in those protests. And we could also run a, 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 a panel uh, with members of law enforcement um, and you can put that together, you, it, it's not, um, obviously we bring an editorial eye to kind of what's appropriate to say in that conversation, but neither of those contributions need to say the whole truth. Um, and what's more, you don't need to tone them down. In fact, I often find myself kind of urging my writers to put it a little stronger um, and take the gloves off because I think that helps sharpen things. Yeah. And then I will, I will say then too, for Plow in particular, um, and uh, as for comment, we, we don't just publish Christian material, but we are published by a Christian community. Um, we publish from a Christian worldview. And part of that um, is love of enemies. Um, and that's a value that we do try to practice in a way that I don't think involves um, smoothing over differences. Plow has been around for 100 years. Our founding editor um, literally faced down the original Nazis, um, and he corresponded with Hitler um, and addressed him as beloved in his letter to make the point that love to enemies goes to everyone. Um, and that is something that I believe needs to inform our publishing, not that we're going to platform people with hateful views, but that we are not going to be pressured into picking sides of uh, friend versus enemy. Um, we will try to seek the divine spark wherever it is um, to be found. And um, that is obviously easier said than done. Um, but I look back to the beginning years of Plow and Weimar and Nazi Germany, and I think it, it can be done in a way that has integrity, but also um, doesn't take on a shrill us versus them, them tone because there's something fundamentally untrue about that human beings are human beings um, underneath, no matter how hateful um, their ideologies and their actions. <laughs>
I, uh, I do think there's a thing interesting, or so Hedgehog is, is not a religious publication, um, but there are certain, like in one sense, I have like personally commissioned and worked with authors on a fairly broad range from people who I think would describe themselves as reactionary to um, uh, communists and socialists. Um, and uh, one thing I, I was thinking when I said no one gets mad at us is that even though we have a, a readership that basically like also occupies that spectrum, the articles are always received charitably, which is fortunate in that way. But what I can't imagine us publishing is some kind of uncritical piece about effective altruism or something. Like, uh, and it seems like, I mean, I guess, in some ways, what there 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 are like uh, philosophical differences that are not political differences, um, and so I could see us doing something similar to the kind of plow thing where you have a, a very kind of pro um, political violence take and then a law enforcement take and so on. But what I can't imagine us publishing is somebody being like like with the coronavirus, well, uh, old people have fewer years and they're of less good use. So we really might as well <laughs> not vaccinate them and let them die. Like like that, that kind of calculating perspective just seems completely out of place. Um, but I thought of that while, while you were talking, Peter, because I think we, we also strive for a broad range of people, but I, It's interesting to think about the kind of philosophies that just are not compatible almost right. with the whole small magazine project. Well, I think we all, I, you're absolutely right, Barbara, to, to <laughs> offer that uh, limitation. I mean, we all, that, there's things that are beyond the pale for each of our publications, clearly, and that defines who we are as editors, um, what you don't publish, I, I believe. Um, you know, it's the... Uh, it's the New York Times op-ed page argument. What is beyond the pale? What what are we not gonna right. give a space to? But I, I was thinking of the coronavirus thing because uh, the New Atlantis published something from Joe Davis, who mm -hmm. uh, used to be our publisher and is still associated with the Institute. And what's that guy's name? Emmanuel Ezekiel, Ezekiel Emmanuel, <laughs> one yes. of these. I uh, thought they were <laughs> Yeah, the guy who thinks that people shouldn't live past 70 which is an argument he has published in the Atlantic and he's been appointed to the coronavirus bioethicist panel thing. Um, and so he's like made this argument in uh, medical journals that like uh, basically people over a certain age should just kind of be neglected uh, in this instance. Um, I mean, it's kind of insane to me that the Atlantic published that frankly, but I guess publishing things that have that kind of edge to them is sort of their, I don't want to say gimmick because that sounds disrespectful, but. Yeah, and I mean, maybe this comes up, I think Anne has published in some, maybe a, a, an editorial comment that you, you see uh, magazines as aspirational communities. Uh, and this sort of gets to that point too, like you know, how do you, where do you draw the lines of the community or how do you shape the vision for that community? You know, I think about this too, when I put together a syllabus for a course, uh, I want, you know, kind of like Peter was saying, I want texts that offer different perspectives or, or talk to each other in interesting ways. But then there are also texts that I just wouldn't put on there because they're not artistically uh, meritorious or they're not, they don't, you know, I, don't, I think they're beyond the pale in some fashion. So clearly we want sort of capacious, vital discourse but, but we nonetheless are trying to shape a, a real community. So uh, maybe anything else, Anne, do you want to chime in or anybody else about how, how you try to help your readers and writers um, envision and participate in a healthy formative community where they might change their minds. They might uh, grow and, and, and uh, develop their own thinking on these matters. Um, I wish I could say that was, I'm not sure that's my original line, although <laughs> 
use it. Um, I think I originally heard it um, from, I believe it was like Andy Ferguson, who is one of my favorite um, magazine writers, um, when he was talking about like his early years helping found the Weekly Standard back in the 90s. And I was so like drawn and, and just sort of charmed by that, you know, romantic intellectual camaraderie life of just like being on an editorial team. And, and then I was, I was sort of was always struck by that line, like a magazine at the end of the day has a certain kind of vision. And yeah, he just said that, or someone, someone in that world said that. And um, so I borrowed it as like an orienting axle. And I think concretely we're a comment is actually in the process of trying to, you know, strategize. How do we make that real? In, you know, we, we do these things called comment suppers and we like try to create little meaning reading discussion groups around the content that, that just to be concrete about it. But we're also trying to think about, you know, would it be possible to sort of forge, forge this and thick overlapping networks in different places across sectors. And so there are ways to think about ideas and community building, you know, reinforcing one another um, that I'm not sure any magazine out there has particularly figured out. I, more broadly, as I've continued to sort of ask myself, um, you know, we're not really trying to ch change anybody. We're, we're trying to provide the context within which people can think. And our particular readers, I sort of think of them like they, they're they troubled by the state of the world, but they're also people of hope. And they are kind of, you know, they're in the trenches of whatever sphere they're engaging, be they in medicine or police or um, tough part of Detroit or whatever, pastors, nurses, et cetera. And um, it's sort of like, yes, we're trying to frame, we're trying to kind of um, give them a wide panoply of, of, of thought life that's both resonant with the reality they're somewhat disturbed by, but also giving them handholds to help be constructive in their environment um, that are in accordance with values they may hold or faith they may hold or not. Um, but somehow s seem like towards healing, I guess. But it's, I, I think in some ways we're trying to create, whether you want to call it a school of thought or maybe more these days, like a school of disposition, a, a sensibility, or somehow in, in however diverse and even in conflict with one another pieces in a given issue may be per, I love what Pete was saying about the sh wanting to create things to be sharp. I think of like every magazine issue, like a menu, a dinner menu, and you do want dishes to be very different from one another in some sense, but for there to, at the end of it all, to be this mysterious kind of flow and unity. Um, I, you know, I, I guess we, we would love to say that we're helping to help, you know, we're helping to create or nurture a dispositional cast that is characterized by things like humility and yet seeking ex excellence and, you know, grace and an appreciation for beauty and originality and creative risk taking. And, you know, we could, we have sort of a profile of the sort of person that we think is already drawn to us, but just needs a little bit more of a sense that they're not alone in their intellectual and intellectual curiosity and kind of um, civic action. Um, so I'm, I'm still kind of working on that aspirational community piece myself as, as we think about strategically, you know, moving forward as a magazine. Um, but it's, it's certainly not ideological. Like it's not a, it's not tribal in that sense, but, you, but it is tribal in, um, you know, these are my people that, that sense. Um, and I think I found my people and, um, it's kind of fun to see how that's not homogenous on a lot of levels, but maybe more deeply homogenous where it counts. I want to say it's Alan Jacobs in How to Think, where he talks about something along those lines, like surround yourself with people who think in, in ways you admire and who think well, even if they might come to different conclusions. So that, yeah, it's, it's a community of people who think in a certain way or value certain modes of thinking rather than they, they end up towing the same ideological party line. My, uh, one of my favorite professors in college, although if, if anyone from St. John's is here, they're going to wrap me because they're not called professors. <laughs> um, but uh, they call the St. John's tutors. Oh, wow. Uh, because they do not profess. Uh, he told me, he gave me a piece of advice that I guess he had gotten in graduate school, which was write for friends. Mm. And not in the sense that uh you're writing to people who agree with you but don't presume an audience that is both hostile and stupid <laughs> like presume an active interested and at least marginally charitable audience um 
and I found that really helps. I mean, particularly in writing about like, both in editing people through sort of contentious pieces, like you can kind of both protect them, yeah. but also, you know, part of your job as an editor is to protect them both by pointing out weak spots, but also to protect them from that voice. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like, yeah, some people aren't gonna like that piece and that's okay. Uh, but also as a writer, I think the idea of writing for friends has been helpful, particularly if I'm writing about um, like a religious subject in a non-religious publication, because instead of sort of trying to like justify doing this, I just kind of presume that somebody's reading this because they think it's interesting and then like move from there. Um, but I think, and I mean, I think the, one of the worst things about the internet for writing is that, uh, and there are a lot of good things about the internet for writing, but the worst thing is that it really encourages you to both look for the stupidest version of whatever you don't like um, and to write as if there's like the people who get it and there's the kind of unwashed idiot masses and like that's, <laughs> that's it. Like you're one of those two. Um, it's, I don't know, uh, it's really bad. I think particularly not engaging with the best version of what you disagree with is a real plague. I, I love, uh, you know, that uh, that term and you use the school of disposition. You know, I find it's a reality um, and that's what really is so, so great about magazines. Um, and it's not just, you know, I sometimes wonder, is that just in my head? Does it make me feel good as an editor to think that, you know, Plow is creating this community, um, bringing people together, uh, you know. We just, uh, but it was very gratifying. We just got back 3,000 responses from readers on a survey we did. And that was sort of the overwhelming, um, one overwhelming thing that many said was, um, I'm not alone. You know, I, there's other people who are also thinking about the same things. They may not um, think the same things as I do, but I'm always excited to, to find out what, um, what, they're, what they're saying. And I feel like I'm part of this uh, network or even a little more, more than a network. And in that sense, magazines, not because of their editors for sure, <laughs> but because they are a kind of educational community, um, really do change people's minds. Um, they open people's uh, perspectives to things they wouldn't expect. Um, and I've seen it many times, um, just in the, the few years I've been working here at Plow. And, and that I think Jeff is, uh, you know, gets back to your original question of what do small magazines and, and the university have in common. Um, they are a place where you encounter texts, where you encounter people and ideas um, that are meant to be life changing and should be. And uh, you're going to find emerge different from the encounter. Um, so there is something at stake uh, when you hopefully open a magazine and take it seriously, what it's saying to you, um, that adds a, a, a level of sort of existential um, buzz to the uh, experience. And uh, that's what I love about magazines. Amen. Yeah, I agree. Humanist manifesto right there, Peter. That's beautiful. <laughs> I, I wanted to maybe raise this question that Jess Hale asked in the Q and A. Uh, it is kind of an interesting question. Uh, what role do you see for public intellectuals not located in the academy for writing for small magazines? Um, in some respects, that reminds me of uh, again Alan Jacobs' essay a couple of years ago now about public intellectuals and whether that was a kind of a lost breed. And it kind of touches on some of the, the other themes we've been discussing regarding kind of disciplinary boundaries. And then these magazines trying to reach beyond that and speak to a broader public uh, and from and for um, broader modes of discourse. Uh, do you think that there's a role for public intellectuals? And if so, what might that be? And, and how might a magazine foster that? I mean, our goal, I, I would love to get, a, like, Plow had an amazing issue, your family issue, Peter, where you had that great essay by Ross on the process, on the family and 
you know, yes, he's a columnist, but I, I consider him like a public intellectual in many ways. Um, and, you know, occasionally we all crave to get that both, frankly, the big name, but also that Renaissance generalist um, in our pages that has both force of wit and writing ability and uh, is not afraid of, you know, is not afraid of a little public fractiousness because it's like they live every day. So I, but, but I probably, I feel a sense of like um, all of our magazines should be, if we could name, and I think it, sadly it's sort of shrinking the realm of like serious public intellectuals um, who have that kind of uh, gravitas as well as the, the sort of humanistic breadth. Um, just a personal opinion as I watch the landscape, I could be, I hope I'm wrong, um, but I would love to know that their offices are filled with great magazine shelves of all of our magazines and that we're sort of feeding them um, uh, and that they would make, you know, historically, I think a lot of those folks spent not that they didn't spend their college days doing class so seriously, they spent their days in the magazine stacks um, at least 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, so, that that's sort of when I think of our relationship, I, I love to publish them, but also we I really just love to think we're feeding them. And there's the um, there's the Ross Douthat and Cornell West's and uh, Emily Wilson's and um, all those people would love to have write for us and occasionally we'll look out and we 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 get one of them, but I do see you know. And the folks who do write for us, we actually have quite a few of those generalists. They're not yet public intellectuals, you know, with a capital P and I, but they are people whose mind, you know, goes broadly and they connect um, the literary, the philosophical, the political, um, the religious. You know, I think of a few, um, you know, on both the right and the left who have written for us and are writing for us. And I'm really excited you know, uh, whether it's a Phil Chrisman or a Zito Madu um, or a Joy Clarkson, um, there, there are these voices. Now, wh how, is, how is life going to look for them um, as this whole higher education um, post-COVID shakes itself out? I think that's a really good question. Um, in the meantime, though, you know, we do try to do our best as a magazine to make it worth our while to write for us. Um, and that's, we do our best. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, I don't think, like in the sort of basic brutal economics of it, I don't think that anyone could live off of writing for the hedgehog <laughs> um, unless they were a mouse. And uh, that would be impressive in its own way, but um, yeah, or a hedgehog. Uh, God, that was right there. Um, uh, I do think, I mean, I am very, I, uh, I think that one unfortunate trap that people can fall into in commissioning or what have you is to look for people who already bring a kind of prestige to the publication um, instead of looking for people who uh, have real talent that no one's using. And I think, you know, on the one hand, all the graduate students and so on who are willing to publish, publish publicly uh, are a real boon, but I do think it's, um, in some ways it's made commissioning kind of a lazy process because people aren't going out and looking for those writers who didn't go to grad school or maybe didn't even go to college, you know, but who are very uh, intelligent, have an interesting sensibility, have something to say. Uh, and, um, uh, I think it's, I don't know, I, th I think it's too bad. Uh, it's certainly something that I work on in my, my own commissioning. I guess like one of the people I was happiest to publish last year um, is this woman, Vanessa Place, who's a poet and a defense attorney. Um, and I don't think she has any academic affiliation, um, but, uh, 
Uh, sorry, a new question popped up and now I'm distracted. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, I guess I feel like there is there is a space for for people to be commissioning more ambitiously, whether or not the economics of that work out on the writer side. Um, uh, I think. Uh, well, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to like single out any writer I've worked with aside from from Vanessa Place, who um, is quite well established within the poetry world and does not need my <laughs> my thumbs up. Um, well, yeah, that's a good a good um, point, Barbara. I think, and you know, I can think of, of writers in other publications represented here as well who might not have, well, who don't have the name recognition of a outfit or something, and yet who can still write, you know, a, a very, and, and that's it. It sticks with you that a couple of years later, I'm still thinking about. I mean, I think um, maybe I shouldn't single someone out, but I thought the essay that Plow published on Dvorak uh, last year by B, by Nathan was so moving, such a weird, you know, I would never think, oh, that's going to be a great essay, but it was. And I, and I thought about it for months afterwards. Um, so I think that to me is one of the reasons I read these kind of publications, because you, you find topics and voices that you wouldn't find otherwise that are incredibly moving. And, and Nathan Beacon um, is, had just graduated from college uh, with a bachelor's from a small Catholic, you know, college in Texas and uh, send us that piece. And uh, he's written for it since, but uh, th that's how we kind of fell in love. I, I just saw there was a question um, about how we find new talent. And I think part of it is, is luck. I'd be very curious actually what Ann Barber have to say with it. But the other part of it is we find we have to consciously steer away from doing the easy pitches as Barbara was just saying. Um, th 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 there are people you know can turn out decent stuff on a deadline and you won't have to work too hard to get it to a spot. Um, and we try really hard and, and, uh, to just resist that when we have editorial meetings and uh, make a point of, you know, and, and no offense to anyone out there, but the, the associate professor writers, um, the ones who know a lot about this thing and are sent you this, this piece that's pretty good and it's okay and you could take it and wouldn't have to do a lot um, and those people are fantastic right um, but if you only run a magazine on those um, it would be a drug and you would never take the risks do the work of doing something more interesting so we actually have almost a bit of a quota system of, of new writers um, and we find them on Twitter with people doing an interesting Twitter thread that just seems like that could be a piece and often it takes you six nine months um, there's also just people I've met just socially who you talk to and talk to over the course of years. And finally, they agree to write that piece um, and they really have something to say. Um, but it is work. And uh, of course, nobody running a small magazine is going around looking for more of that work. Um, <laughs> but uh, you kind of have to force yourself. And of course, you know, uh, I have great fellow editors who are better at it than I am. Um, but we, we try to encourage each other. I, I want to go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I mean, I think the worst thing about the, two of the authors that I've worked with that I have been happiest to work with or what have you, I basically reached out to on the basis of their Twitters. <laughs> Worked out though. Um, uh, that being uh, uh, Phil Chrisman and uh, Mary Townsend. Um, both of whom are university affiliated, but who hadn't. Phil had published some things. Um, I did not give Phil his break, <laughs> but uh, I think that honor belongs to John Wilson. But um, uh, I used to have a lot of smaller web publications that I would go through kind of regularly. But the problem <laughs> is that those keep on dying. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I used to go to Open Letters Monthly to see, like, who's writing for them. Uh, that's gone now. Um, a lot of, of small independent web publications, they fold every day. So it's like the the places to see even kind of like, like a thing that somebody's published on basically a friend-run blog. Like, that gets smaller and smaller because 
those things just keep on shutting down. Um, uh, I have also gotten a lot of work from Twitter, I will say. I think, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> But my first my first published piece was because of something that I tweeted. So, um, well, that's a couple of options then about how how editors can discover. Yeah, you know, find a find something that's kind of like the equivalent of the bar that people go to after work, where you can kind of hang out and listen for the interesting yeah. voices. Um, well, I appreciate this. I, I want to wrap things up, but maybe you could do a lightning round uh, where you each say one thing that gives you hope or excites you about your work. I love our writers. Um, they are so thoughtful and so dedicated to what they do. Uh, and, um, you know, every issue, there there are new people that we find to write for us are people that we want, but we can't fit in. And uh, as, as dire as things seem sometimes, that seem, seem sometimes, uh, there are so many great, thoughtful people who can really write out there. And uh, every time I work with them, it's a real honor. I would echo that and just say, um as both a reader and editor and, and a writer, but someone who these days mostly spends time working with writers. Um, uh, and I just answered the previous question on here and that I, I don't only just look for writers, I look to convert people into writers. So that's its own thing about how you find unusual voices. This is a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but it's just the power of naming never ceases to kind of you know, take me back in a good way. Like it's sort of like when you read a great book and you feel like you're meeting a friend or someone and, you know, we do a lot, we do, we're basically a cultural criticism, cultural hope kind of publication. And so when you find people who can articulate the instincts that a lot of people are feeling, but they may come at it from different ways or they haven't been able to articulate. Um, that's just, there's something about that that I think is, um, I can't, it sounds so small, but um, feels like not that you're creating reality, but you're really accompanying people in present time, um, hopefully in a way that, um, you know, uh, in, illuminates them, expands them, exalts them, et cetera, and um, makes them better neighbors, basically. And so I think that that has just continues to be a privilege and um, I, I know it never gets old. It's like you're always hungry again for the next meal. Um, so that just the articulation process of, of what's actually seems to be beneath the waves of the headlines. Yeah, really uh, so much similar to what's been said. Uh, you know, I think in, in every human being is, is a, a kind of desire um, and a, a hope and a dream that another world is possible to use the name of a book we published. Um, and to, to awaken that, to break ground for it, and um, to sort of see loving networks form, friendships form, um, that, that's really exhilarating. And uh, it gives me a lot of hope. And actually, I, I think in many ways, you know, um, I was just rereading uh, C.S. Lewis's Learning in Wartime, his 1939, um, his well-known 1939 speech, which I'm sure is very familiar to, to all our listeners. Um, this thing isn't, you know, this type of study is not the most important thing, but it is a important thing and it's worth doing and it's always worth getting excited about and doing well. And uh, through it, you know, uh, in a Christian sense, giving glory to God, so. Amen. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. And I uh, continue to benefit from your d diligent editorial work uh, and your work as writers. So. I'm an appreciative reader of all of your, your endeavors as well. But uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom and uh, having these, this conversation openly and, and thinking through some of the, the principles that lie behind uh, the way you approach your work as editors. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night.